So the question, is this ancient quarrel, call it digital analog, with its eternal promises and endless tug of war about to be severed? Has the image finally been tamed by the rule of the computer, the digitization of the analog sign? Gallison doesn't answer this question, and perhaps it has no answer, though I, I think we want to respect both the philosophical and historical impulses in this discussion. That is, there seems to be something both eternal and historical about this problem, as if every solution simply reintroduces a problem at a new level. The um, impasse, in my view, is precisely what necessitates a science of the image, and I mean by that uh, perhaps a mathematical science, rather than a merely instrumental use of images as unexamined instruments in getting at other things. But we have to, I think, uh, at some point, at least venture a definition uh, of the image. I've written about this a number of times. I won't go through all of them. But I'll, I'll go back to my own starting point, which is uh, the logic of Charles Sanders Peirce, who takes it as axiomatic that an image is not necessarily a picture, a, a visual picture, uh, but a sign by resemblance, uh, a significant relation of resemblance, uh, a mimetic sign, in other words, uh, which can be in any medium and not, not necessarily visual. Uh, this means, of course, that the whole notion of the specificity, uh, the specifically visual image, and all that accompanying language of intuition, concreteness, perception, immediacy, graphic arrays, and so forth, has to be put into question along with it. One of Chris's deepest insights, and I'm just uh, quoting here from his, uh, his text, uh, often forgotten, is that the algebraic equation itself is no less an icon than its diagrammatic rendering two-dimensional space. The equal sign, uh, like the brackets of set theory or other relational pointers, uh, produces what he thinks of as an icon. Uh, and you can see his argument here. When in algebra we write equations one under another in a regular array, uh, especially when we put uh, uh, corresponding letters for cor corresponding efficiency, the array is an icon. Here is an example. In fact, every algebraic equation is an icon. So that opposition we started with might have one over x and the diagrammatic uh, display of it. They're both icons. It's not that the image is one place and something like logic is in the other place. There's the, the opposition is quite phantasmatic. Um, these relationships also obtain that is, relations of similitude, identity, and equivalence, and so forth, um, uh, obtained in uh, uh, what we could have called in the past in literary studies verbal icons. Uh, and we know that something like uh, names and metaphors are verbal images, uh, but in a very different sense of the word image, that is, not visual images necessarily. So an image is a double sign, then, naming perhaps something we see like a portrait or a landscape or a graph, and something we comprehend as a signifying relation to something beyond itself. This portrait represents that person. Our ordinary language captures this double relation when we say that a portrait looks like the person it represents. Looking and likening, seeing and similitude are fused and confused in ordinary representational images which is why we run into difficulty when we encounter an image that doesn't look like anything or that doesn't look like what it represents. The scientific image of the atom as a kind of miniature solar system, for instance, is widely understood to be a completely false picture of the atom if we take it as a picture that is supposed to look like actual atoms. It's rather a model that attempts to capture some features of the atom that are graspable in other mainly quantitative terms. It is surely an image, and it's even a visual image, uh, but it's not one that looks like what it represents, if we understand it properly. Of course, we can go on and make a meta image which says it's like a solar system, in, in which case the image leads us down the primrose path to error, and that's a crucial part of what the science of images would have to address. So let's say a first step. 
just in the having the science of images, just, just to re release it from the tyranny of the physical eye and this literal notion, especially in mathematics, that somehow geometry occupies a different sphere from algebra. Um, and admit that icons circulate through many domains, mental, mathematical, verbal, uh, as well as visual. The images we should be concerned with in science then are not just the pictures, graphs, and physical models, literally understood, but also the metaphors that provide pictures of a domain of research, the universe as a heat engine, or as a clock, or as a ball of string, pictures that need not be made visible or drawn graphically, but can, as Wittgenstein would have said, lay, lay in our language, and we can't get outside of them. The picture is there, hovering behind what we say. So images, then, are not medium-specific, though they are never encountered outside of some medium or other. An image can clearly move from one medium to another, appearing now as an equation, now as a diagram, now as a figure in a narrative, now as a figure in a narrative painting, uh, or in a, a lyric text in phrases. Erwin Panofsky, one of the modern founders of iconology, called the image a motif to emphasize uh, it, its repeatability, its iterability in many different pictures of concrete instantiations. But he failed to draw the obvious conclusion that result resides in our ordinary language of talking about images, that the image and the picture are very distinct, yet intimately linked entities. The English language, but not uh, the German language, registers this distinction when we say that we can hang a picture. Uh, but it would seem very odd to talk about hanging an image. The picture is the image plus the material support, uh, the physical medium uh, in which the image appears. But the image as such, if we can speak of such a thing, is not itself a material thing, though it must always appear in or on some material support, a surface, statue, or within the body of an embodied perceiver. An image is a relationship and an appearance. It might be better, in fact, to think of images as events or happenings happenings and as objects, in order to register their often fleeting temporality, appearing and disappearing, going in and out of focus, or in Peter Gallison's lovely metaphor, scattering and gathering. We might then want to speak with phenom phenomenologists like Bachelard, Nermot Monti, uh, of the onset of the image, or with Wittgenstein about the dawning uh, of an aspect. But only, I think, an immaterialist phantasmatic conception of the image that treats its being in what Jacques Derrida described as a hauntology, not an ontology, but a hauntology, can capture its special and spectral nature. Okay, not for mathematics. This section is about the physics of the image. Now I realize everything I've said to this point is going to convince you that I am a, a, a mere idealist. Uh, or, or worse, and that this is a, a very unfashionable position and time when invocations of materiality and embodiment are absolutely required. Uh, but I want to now turn my attention to physics and to matter. Uh, and, you know, matter is one of the most maddeningly repeated words in our time. And I think it's clear that a monistic materialism, that is something said, well, everything is matter. Like that these, uh, every once in a while you hear somebody say, it's turtles all the way down. Uh, I always want to say, nonsense. It's not true. It can't be turtles all the way down. Uh, and it can't be, everything can't be mad. Uh, it, the same principle. Uh, I think that any materialism worth the name is going to have to be a dialectical materialism. Not necessarily Marx's form, but uh, uh, he, he's a good place to start. Uh, think about, Marx's reflections on the, the most material thing in the world, the commodity. And the, my favorite line from those reflections, so far, Marx says, no chemist has ever discovered exchange value either in a pearl or a diamond. Exchange value, as Marx made clear, is not a physical property of objects, but of the circulation and exchange of objects, their alienation from use, their abstraction from their concrete material properties. 
Images are another form of the exchange value of things, operating primarily at the perception and cognitive level. Though, of course, the commodification of images themselves is a familiar enough phenomenon. And the fetishism of commodities marks precisely the moment when the spectral phantasmatic character of images seems to settle like an aureole around the physical body of an object. So uh, when we say matter, I think we need to remember what the great materialist uh, had to say about the commodity. I would also just mention that if we turned our attention directly to the history of physical theories of matter, uh, I would recommend Daniel Tiffany's uh, wonderful book, Toy Medium, a kind of iconology of materialism uh, that shows that matter itself, in theories all the way uh, from the ancient materials down to quantum physics, treat matter as what he calls a lyric substance. Uh, that is, that matter, the closer you get to it, the more uh, intimate you become with it, the more it's like a storm uh, of forces than a solid lump. Uh, the, uh, we can't address matter except by way of images, by way of pictures of uh, what matter is. But an even simpler demonstration of the peculiar physics of the image can be glimpsed if we raise the question of their destruction. Iconoclasm is the effort to destroy images, usually for political or religious reasons. Though Again, Peter Gallison's account of 20th century physics makes it clear that there can be professional and epistemological motives for the effort to banish images. And many people in quantum physics thought that this was it. We could finally have a physics where we didn't need to have an iconology of matter. But again, this story makes it clear the image invariably comes back in a kind of return of the repressed, uh, which is something that could have been predicted by a historical reflection on the age old crusade to stamp out idolatry, um, to, that is to purge the world of graven images, uh, and even in the most extreme cases of verbal images. And this is not simply a matter of grinding or melting down the golden calf, scattering it on the water, forcing the Israelites to drink it, as in the Exodus story. As we know, this sort of materialist effort to destroy an image always fails. The calf survives as a verbal image in the very narrative that tells of its destruction, and then is reborn as a visual graphic image in scores of Renaissance paintings. So the effort to destroy images can't rest with just visual images or their sculpture, sculptural or graphic rendering. The most persistent effort I know of to achieve utter annihilation of images in every sphere that is, in words and even in thought, it is the commentaries of Maimonides' Guide for the, Guide for the Perplexed, which finds that even the language of the Bible uh, itself is riddled with misleading metaphors and concrete uh, nouns that attribute things like a body, a face, hands, and feet, and a, and a spatial location to the invisible, unrepresentable deity. So if something is sitting at the right hand of God, how can that be in the media? God has a hand. Uh, that's the slippery slope to idolatry for my monuments. The mandate of iconoclasm is finally not just the destruction of graven images, but the purging of words and ideas as well to arrive at a purified language and consciousness that's capable of thinking about God without really thinking about anyone or anything. This, of course, is a, uh, a rather rare state to get yourself into. We know there are spiritual exercises that aim at this, but actually aim at the evacuation of all content to consciousness. Uh, it, but it does have the virtue of revealing just how difficult, perhaps impossible, it would be to really enforce the second commandment, the commandment against graven images. The destruction of images, as Michael Tausig has argued, is a sure way of guaranteeing them an even more potent presence in memory or as reincarnated in the so a fundamental law of physics of image is, uh, and this, I hope you'll hear an echo of a, of a physical law here, images cannot be destroyed. The picture or the physical support in which they appear can be destroyed, but the image survives destruction, if only as a memory in the mind, that is, in the body of the destroyer. The question arises then, if we're going to pursue the metaphor of the physics of the image, is it subject to a law of conservation 
similar to the one that governs, say, matter and energy uh, in the physical world. That is, should we go on to say that images can neither be created nor destroyed? It's easy to see why it's so difficult to destroy images, but creation seems to be another matter. Surely new images are always being created by artists and scientists, as well as by ordinary people, from the child's first drawing to the ordinary snapshot. Here I think we've reached, or at least I've reached, a kind of boundary of what I understand about this. But my intuition, if you'll allow me that uh, uh, strategy, is that images actually cannot be created at least not from nothing. Insofar as images are always images of something, then what they are images of must always logically and temporally precede them. We say that a child is the image of its parent, by which we mean uh, there's a discernible family resemblance, even though we also know that in some other respects, the child looks nothing like its parent. The image then is not the bearer of the new, the different in the child, but of what was already present in the parent. So the rule of likeness, uh, my Mises, is a conservative rule, defying innovation and insisting on the return of the similar. Also, always, of course, with a difference, which is what makes them. Uh, but I'll get to that in a, in a bit. This is true, I suspect, even when we're attempting to create a totally new original image, and explains why it's so difficult to imagine what it would mean to create a radically new image. Um, as distinct from a new picture, nothing's easier than to create a new picture. And we could talk about the surrealists here and the, the way uh, bringing uh, hybrid images together, producing monsters, producing unsuspected combinations, but of course all the constituents uh, are already there, which is what makes them recognizable as what they are. If an image were completely new, how would we recognize? how we can know it was an image. It's this moment of recognition that makes the image readable as such and it provides a thread of continuity with variation <coughs> and difference that makes it possible to see images morphing, as in a Michael Jackson video, from one identity to another. This morphing would be purely abstract and not non-referential if it didn't pass through moments of stillness, freeze frames, in which multiple identities are registered as this image or that image. And even if we imagine this, uh, I wish I had the talent to produce an abstract video of what I am seeing and what I'm trying to get you to see here. Uh, it, it, one of those marvelous things that it, it's everyday child's play on Nova to show an abstract image morphing through an infinite number of variations. Um, these various stages of morphogenesis would each have a specific gestalt as this form or that form at any given moment of the transformation. Perhaps the only sense in which a new image could appear would be in some composite or synthetic uh, transitional appearance, as in the Galtonian photographs that blur together several portraits to produce a portrait that, we say, looks strangely familiar, but is of no individual, ever, whoever existed. OK, and now the third section, the biology. I warned you at the outset that the search for a science of images might lead into an abyss of speculation. And I hope so far you haven't been disappointed. Uh, I've traced the mathematics of images as diagrammatic and logical relations, and the physics of images as immaterial phantasmatic entities that require a physical medium to make their appearance. But what about the life sciences? Could there be a natural history of images built around a meta picture of images as organisms or life forms. This question can be approached by returning to the question of the Galtonian photograph as a new or created image. The reason this Galtonian image is strangely familiar is that it uh, raises the question of the image as a type or a typical representation rather than as a representation of an individual. We are familiar enough with this phenomenon in the realm of stereotypes and what might be called reductive or schematic images. The smiling face on the bumper sticker is recognizable as a face, but not as any particular face. In fact, when we speak of recognizing what an image represents, the form of recognition can be quite general and abstract. It can amount to seeing something as a face or a body without seeing it as any particular face or body. 
It's just the, the, the men's room and ladies' room, the, the, those logos are not of any man or any woman. Uh, and this is just the way we recognize also abstract forms, squares and circles, without thinking of them as unique particular entities, or garden hoses as DNA uh, molecules. A specific drawing, diagram, sculpture may function as the token of a type, a concrete embodiment of a quite general and generic image, one that can be translated back into the algebraic icon in Curse's sense. But this generalizing property of images, I think, is exactly what links them to the life sciences, and quite specifically to the concept of the species and the specimen. One thing we couldn't account for in the physical model of the image was the question of morphine, of transformation, and the genesis of family resemblance with similitude and difference across a series of instances. But the metaphor of the image as life form brings this process into focus, at the same time that it raises a set of whole new set of difficulties. If images are like living things, rather than spectral ghostly entities uh, we encountered in the realm of physics, then surely they can be created and destroyed. But here we must remind ourselves that I'm constructing a multi-tiered stack of analogies in which material objects are to apparitions as pictures are to images, as specimens are to species. And by the way, the etymology of the word species in some ways justifies this since it comes from uh, the same root word as the, the image or the specular uh, appearance. So I'm not suggesting that a picture or a material object can't be created or destroyed. The painting, the manuscript, they can surely be made and unmade. But think of what it would mean to destroy a species rather than a specimen. Not impossible, perhaps, uh, and a quite realistic prospect in an era that's defined by its consciousness of endangered species and extinctions. So perhaps a move from the physics to the biology of the image uh, reveals a level of our science that it wasn't possible to address within the sphere of physical inanimate matter. It's in the sphere of the life sciences that our science of images would confront the problem of the reproduction of images, their mutations and evolutionary transformations. If the, and not to mention their monstrous uh, novelties, dead end uh, instances. If the image is to iconology, what the species is to biology, then pictures uh, are the specimens in the natural history of images. This natural history is, of course, inevitably also a cultural and social history, but it's one that's focused on the second nature that we have created around ourselves, the entire image repertoire of human consciousness. We've always understood that the arts were, as Aristotle insisted, imitations of nature, and that this meant not just that they represented or resembled the natural world, but that they themselves were a kind of nature in process an expression of the species identity of human beings. Now we live in a moment of crisis when the human is regarded by some as an extinct uh, or endangered species itself. The post-human looms as the horizon of speculative thought. At the same time, we're told that the ancient indestructible domain of images has been mastered finally by the digital, and that numbers, calculations, will finally replace us and images in an infinite circuit of information thinking there are Friedrich Kipper's gramophone film typewriter and wonderfully horr horrifying uh, uh, a picture of the future of, uh, of the species. Neither posthumanism nor the digital image seems to me a particularly coherent uh, concept, especially as I put in the position of being the master concept. But I do think they belong together as symptoms of a kind of failure to think historically or philosophically and to take refuge in a kind of post-historical presentism. And we now live at the end of history, and it ended when, you know, 1989, 1945, uh, you pick the date. Uh, they also help us to see why the two most conspicuous and highly publicized natural images of our time uh, dominate our picture of the fate of our own species. Uh, I'm going to show you a couple of these and conclude. I'm thinking, of course, of the fossil as a generic brand of images and the clone, the, uh, the image of genetic engineering. The 
destruction of a species is not necessarily the destruction of its image. On the contrary, extinction of a species, and this is just a kind of definition of what a fossil is, is a precondition of its resurrection as image in the form of fossil traces. This is an image of a uh, quarry wall at Dinosaur National Monument in Utah. The fossil record is a material and pictorial uh, record, a vast iconic archive of extinct species that have inhabited this globe. And of course, fossils are not the only image traces that we have to reconstruct the evolution of life forms. Contemporary paleontology uh, regards birds as the descendants of dinosaurs, placing the reptilians in quite another class. In that sense, the analogy of image and species would need to be qualified further uh, because higher level taxa, such as phyla, also have their clusters of attributes, their family resemblance. The fossil image, then, is what survives the death of a species, just as the corpse is what survives the death of the individual specimen. And the corpse often is an object of ornamentation, decoration, special image practices. <coughs> The sciences of natural history are the species equivalent of the rituals of mummification and preservation of effigies of the dead that find their place in the ethnographic wing of the Natural History Museum. So you see at one end of the museum taxidermy, uh, at the other end uh, the preservation of totem masks. Both are sciences of resurrection and reanimation, uh, an effort of life forms, ourselves, to manage mortality by means of images. But that's exactly what makes them so uncannily similar to that other great breakthrough of the life sciences in our time. The DNA revolution epitomized by the clone and here uh, signified by Dolly the sheep. The clone is the obverse of the fossil. It epitomizes the hope for species immortality and the promise of therapeutic cloning to scrub burst defects from our DNA to produce replaceable organs and ever improve specimens. It also signifies the hope for the immortality of a singular specimen in the utopia of reproductive cloning, where exact duplicates of parent organisms can be produced. The fossil and the clone then play the role of endpoint species for both the image and the organism. Both are quite precisely image families or classes the fossil the product of a slow process of petrifaction, reversed by resurrection and reanimation in the paleontological imagination. It is no accident that most paleontologists have highly developed visual acuity and that many of them are artists or image processors. The fossil is also an allegorical image, a premonition of our own species mortality. It's thus what Walter Benjamin called a dialectical image capturing history at a standstill. In this case, the deep time of the geological record projected backward through the entire history of life on Earth and forward toward the specter of our own extinction. The clone, by contrast, is the technical bio chimera of our time and is thus generally pictured as a monstrosity, an unnatural sterile freak that is pictured verbally as that. Then when you look at Dali, you say, Where's the monster that I was looking for? Uh, it, a big gap between the verbal and the visual image of the clone, I think. Uh, which is made up for in some of the alien films where you get to see, uh, see the monsters that are being produced. So the clone personifies and incarnates in living flesh the anxiety about images that pervades hyper iconoclastic critiques such as Baudrillard's procession of simulacra, copies without an original, indistinguishable copies, the horror of repetition and indefinite sameness, the fear of the double, uh, homophobia, uh, reproduction without difference, confusion of identity and similarity. You know the, the, the drill. The clone then is also a dialectical image. It points forward to a utopian or dystopian future in which the rule of the exact simulacrum is extended to an unprecedented degree. It points backwards for our most archaic fantasies about images, that they are imitations of life in a more than figurative sense now, that some of them possess spora, that literally the breath of life, that they look back, have desires, and agency. That is, in other words, that they are a new species or uh, a new life form, a new set of pictures, if you will. 
All the taboos about image making are revived around the clone, and strange political alliances emerge between echo activists, Greens, and fundamentalist Christians. Notions such as the circulation or mobility of images uh, and, and need to be uh, revised towards something like a migration of images, in which their movements are incessantly regulated, prohibited, or accelerated by fantasies of contamination, plague, and purification. With the clone, the metaphor of the life form as image and vice versa seems to be literalized and rendered reversible. Is it that the image is like a life form or the reverse? The figures of the clone and the fossil merge, as it happens, in this image from Jurassic Park. Uh, a still which captures a velociraptor itself caught in the beam of a film projector that is projecting the DNA sequence that made it possible to clone a living dinosaur from its fossil traces. But this digital dinosaur stands as a nexus point for these speculations on the science of images. It is first a science fictional image, a speculative projection of what the convergence of paleontology and genetic engineering might produce. It's also a technical cinematic image, an early example of the revolution in digital animation that ushered in a whole new era in the relation of animated and live action images. Within the life sciences, this image has to be dismissed as a fantasy, a biological impossibility. But within the science of images, uh, it is a crucial specimen, a kind of rare missing link in the evolutionary record of these strange phantasmatic likenesses and apparitions. In the narrative of the film, you'll recall this animal is breaking into the computer control room of the park and threatening to devour the controllers. Perhaps it's an allegory uh, for our fear that the digitizing of the image uh, may not be a way of controlling the wild kingdom of images uh, or even of making peace between scientific logic and fleshly concrete fiction. Annihilating the, annihilating the golden calf and all the other idols once and for all. For the ultimate lesson of the science of images of science is that these images will not stay put within the domain of science, but continuously break out and carry us in unsuspected directions, going before us like the idols of old. They have lives of their own that exceed our intentions and our use of those instruments. And that's why the science of images will have to be a life science. Thanks very much. Uh, and I think what the science of images would uh, 